This is Fresh Air, and I'm Terry Gross. My guest is Maya Angelou, who has written about her remarkable life in her five volumes of autobiography. Her books testify to the dreams and frustrations of Afro-American women. The first book in her series, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, was published in 1970 and describes her childhood in the South. Her mother left her for 10 years, during which time she was raised by her grandmother. Angela was raped by her mother's boyfriend when she was seven and a half. After the rape, she withdrew into herself and went through a long period of not speaking. Maya Angelou got pregnant and became a mother when she was 16 and unmarried. Her autobiographies describe how she traveled around the country with her son Guy, earning her living as a waitress, prostitute, madam, singer, actress, and writer. They traveled so much, she wrote, that their only home was each other. In the 60s, Angela was active in the civil rights movement and worked with Martin Luther King as the northern coordinator for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Maya Angelou's latest memoir, All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes, published by Random House, is an account of when she was 33 and moved with her son to West Africa, yearning for the sense of home she had been unable to find in America. She writes, We were black Americans in West Africa, where for the first time in our lives, the color of our skin was accepted as correct and normal. Angelo currently lives in North Carolina, where she says she feels more settled than she ever has. She has a lifetime appointment as professor of American studies at Wake Forest University. Maya Angelo told me that she thinks her writing style is influenced by Southern Afro-American preaching and music traditions. I find in my poetry and prose the rhythms and imagery of the best, I mean, when I'm at my best, of the good Southern black preachers, the lyricism of the spirituals and the directness of gospel songs and the mystery of blues are in my music or in my poetry and prose or I missed everything. There's a blues, I was just thinking when I said the mystery of blues, I hadn't thought about that before. But there's a 19th century blues which asks this question. Have you ever had the blues so bad you could feel them in the palm of your hands? Now that's mystery, and that's poetry, and that's what I try for. Did you grow up uh, going to church a lot oh, and listening Lord. to a lot of blues? And I went to church. My grandmother took me to church on Sunday all day long, every Sunday into the night. Then Monday evening was missionary meeting. Tuesday evening was usher board meeting. Wednesday evening was prayer meeting. Thursday evening was visit the sick. Friday evening was choir practice. I mean, and at all those gatherings we sang. We sang long meter hymns, which are almost lost now, Terry Gross. It's a shocking sad loss. What's a long meter hymn? In a long meter hymn, a singer, lin, li, they call it, lays out a line. And then the whole church joins in to in repeating that line. And they form a wall of harmony so tight you can't wedge a pin between it. So that a person would sing, As... Long as I live and troubles rise, I'll hasten to his throne. Then everybody comes in. If I was there, I would sing, As long as I live and and then there are all these twists and turns and melodic uh, accidents, harmonics, and accidental harmonics which take place, which uh, are just uh, delicious to the ear. There really is a connection in your writing between uh, music and, and your words. I, I find your writing very, very musical and uh, just, you know, lovely, lovely to read. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but I think of all those years that you weren't writing. I think of all those years when you were writing articles and, and editing, but you weren't writing books and probably didn't even know you were going to be writing books. And I wonder if you felt it missing, if you knew that you'd be writing like that. No. I thought I would be a poet uh -huh. and playwright. Those were the two forms I really enjoyed. 
Um, I made my living as a journalist, of course, but I thought that I would just stick with those and I would become better and better and better. But in 68, I suppose, I was at a dinner. This is name dropping, but these were the people. James Baldwin had taken me over to see Jules Pfeiffer and Jules then wife, Judy Pfeiffer. And we talked all night, and I really had to work very hard to get a word in because they're all great raconteurs. And the next day, Judy Pfeiffer called the man who is still my editor at Random House and said, if you can get her to write an, um, an autobiography, I think you'd have something. He phoned me a number of times, and I said, no, Robert Loomis. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not interested, until he said to me, well, Miss Angelo, I guess it's just as well that you don't attempt this book, because to write autobiography as literature is almost impossible. So I thought, oh, <laughs> well, in that case, I'd better try. Well, I found that that's what I really, that's the form I love. I love autobiography. I love the form. It challenges me to try to speak through the first person singular and mean the third person plural. Are there poems that influenced you when you were starting to write or that made you want to write? Oh, so many. There's a, a poem called Sympathy of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's. Mr. Dunbar wrote this about 1890. The first stanza is, I know what the caged bird feels ah me when the sun is bright on the upland slopes when the wind blows soft through the springing grass and the river flows like a sheet of glass when the first bird sings and the first bud opes and the faint perfume from its chalice steals i know what the caged bird feels. Oh, dear. The whole poem is so beautiful. There are three verses to it. What else really oh. influenced you? Well, uh, Shakespeare. I was very influenced, still am, by Shakespeare. I couldn't believe that a white man in the 16th century could so know my heart if he could know my heart, a black woman in the 20th century, um, single parent, all the things I was heir to, then obviously I could know a Chinese Mandarin's heart and the heart of a young Jewish boy with braces on his teeth in Brooklyn. It meant I could know if he over those centuries could know me so, that he could write, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone bemoan my outcast state and trouble a deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, I'm desiring this man's art, that man's scope, and with what I most enjoy, contented least. My guest is writer Maya Angelou, and she has a new volume in her autobiographical series, and it's called All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes. You've always had a very unconventional family life. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's, that's one of the subjects you've always written about in your books, um, your mother left you from the period you were 3 to 13, and, and your grandmother brought you up. And um, you were pregnant when you were like 16 15, or something, 15. Yeah. I was just wondering if, if you'd ever thought if you had the option to have an abortion, if you would have done it. And No. Uh-huh. No. Um, in fact, I tried very hard years later with various marriages to have more children, but I was no, never successful. And I was, it, there was no reason given. I mean, I'm supposed to be all right, but, and I tried with the diligence, but uh, it 
to no avail. Um, no, I would never. Well, you know, the story is that if you're a teenager and you're pregnant and, and you're not married, that your life is <laughs> going to be ruined. This is what a lot of people think, and you've certainly well, disproved that with your life. I wouldn't encourage a young woman to uh, become pregnant. I would not. Not um, uh, be because it is not healthy to have the state look after a young person and her child. That's one. Two, a young person is not really qualified on her own without a very strong sub, uh, support system behind her to raise a child if she is not herself raised. In my case, I really had a, a wonderful mom, a great brother. My brother was fantastic when I was young. And, and I had an, an independence. I would no more think of taking um, welfare than I would think of flying to the moon without a rocket because it was pride, absolute. It had nothing to do with goodness of heart or, you know, <laughs> niceness. It was just pride. So I got a lot of jobs and did a lot of things, but I kept my son. As a mother, you traveled a lot, and part of that was because you were a performer, you were yes. a singer, you acted for a while, and your work and your interests took you to many places, and, and teachers, I think, had... Uh, criticized you because, well, you say in your new book that your son had been to 19 schools in 11 years, which yeah. is really quite a, a, a tally. Did you uh, worry about that at all and worry about whether whether your independence and your travels were going to be bad for your son? Did you torment yourself no, about that? No, I never did. I didn't torment myself. I did think about it, but I had no choice. I had to work, and I thought... I was told by one psychologist that he needed, my son needed security. Well, I was his security. Wherever he went or wherever we were, if we, uh, he could always be sure that that tall black lady smiling was there, and that was his mom. I was present. I, I joined the PTA, I mean, in so many cities, and sometimes, I mean, it was during the time when I wore outlandish clothes, outlandish get-ups, as old black people call it. <laughs> I would wear a purple blouse and uh, an Indian sari skirt and a scarf with head, which had little mirrors in it, you know, little bits of things in it, and huge earrings and thong sandals and anklets at which tinkled. Kalinkle, inkle, 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 inkle. Um, and I would join the PTA because my son was in that school, and sometimes he was one of two or three kids, black kids, in the school. So it, it got so bad when he was about 10, he called me, <laughs> me aside one day and asked me, Mother, don't you have any sweater sets? <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. He just thought, Mom, please, don't look so outrageous. But that's an interesting thing, because a lot of parents who lead unconventional lives themselves have some feeling that their children would, would rather fit in than, than come from an unconventional uh, a family. Did you have a conflict with yes, that? Yes, because I didn't own any sweater sets and sort of pleated skirts. <laughs> I had these get-ups. But it wasn't just your clothes that were unconventional. It was your whole sense of life. That's true. And I your was, sense of family. That's true. So he just sort of gritted his teeth and said, oh, God, that's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and recently, a few years ago, I think uh, People magazine, or one of the magazines, uh, had a, did a piece on me. And the writer called Guy. By this time, he's a grown man, and he's a personnel analyst for the county of Sonoma in Northern California, and a very serious young man with a great sense of humor. And uh, they asked him, this reporter asked him, what was it like to be raised by Maya Angelou? He said, well, imagine a liner, a ship, 
going across very rough seas, tied to the ship with a chain, anchored carefully, is a canoe. <laughs> <laughs> I was the canoe. Now picture the ship changing course at any time, always going back to check that the anchor that the the chain held, the canoe wasn't taking on water, and then off we'd go again. <laughs> <laughs> what a great image. <laughs> you, when you were a child, had something terrible happen to you. You were, you were raped when you were, what, eight or seven, or seven and a half. Seven and a half. Mm. Did that make you very protective of your son, knowing the kind of trauma yes. that you can experience as a child <clears throat> and what lasting effects that could have? Not terribly. I mean, it kept me aware. But I never wanted to stifle him. Never. So I tried to live, um, ha- however wild my life may have, may have seemed, to outsiders. I lived a very protective and normal, I thought, life. Uh, my son had a bedtime, and that was when he went to bed. No guests stayed over. There were no chances of anybody taking advantage of mol- or molesting my son. Gentlemen friends I had, I, would, I never had a man stay over in my house unless I was married to him. Um, I would meet, I mean, after Guy would be in bed sometimes, I would go out and stay till dawn and rush home and put on my gown and dressing gown just in time for him to wake up and he'd say, Hi, Mom, you're up so early again. And I would, he would try to hold conversations with me. I'd be so sleepy. I would sit there propped up by my <laughs> elbows on the table saying, Yes, yes, thinking, go to school so I can go to bed. <laughs> and somehow it worked. Was it harder for you than you think it would be for most parents when when your son Guy grew up and became independent? Well, you know, all comparisons become odious. Yeah, sure. You know, I don't know. But it was very hard for me because he had been home to me. Wherever we were, he was home. When you were young, um, you went through a period of, I think, several years of of not speaking. Yes. Um, Was it because of the rape? Yes. Do you think that you developed a sense of of language through all those years of listening and not speaking? I I think of the memory that you have, of the facility for language that you have, and of all those years of of not speaking, what was happening in your mind? Well, I think I I thought of myself as a giant ear. (laughs) 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 I think something out of Gary Larson. A giant ear, which could just absorb all sound. And I would go into a room and just eat up the sound. And I memorized. I, I memorized so many poets. I just had sheaves of poetry. Still do. Um, I would listen to, uh, to the accents. And I still love the way human beings sound. There is no human sound, a voice, which is unbeautiful to me. I love them. And so I'm able to learn languages because I really love the way people talk. And when I was very young, blues singers used to come walking through the South with cigar box guitars really a cigar box and a piece of wood and cat gut strung along it. And they'd come around the store and sing. And the fellows from the Brazos of Texas had a sound which was absolutely Texan. And they'd sing, uh, I'm just running around here, baby, I'm done. Think about you well, my I'm done. Loving you, baby, well, anything you do. Oh, it was so gorgeous. I could pull my hair out. Then the guys who had come from Mississippi 
and a portion of Louisiana had another sound. They would sing, Babe, please don't go. Babe, please don't go. Babe, please don't go back to New Orleans if he derives being nowhere you ever seen. Babe, please don't go. And it was way back in the mouth, see. So I would listen, listen, just fantastic. I still get excited about any human being speaking or singing. Isn't it amazing how that period of being mute probably in its own way helped you become the writer that you are? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm amazed, too, at how you were able to mimic other people's sounds <laughs> when, when you weren't <laughs> using your voice all, all through that period. But you could tell what they were doing because uh, my grandmother spoke like that. She always had a deliberate way of speaking, see. And I would watch and I would know how she was going to say. I mean, when the rest of the word would come out, I knew. Um, and I didn't think I was mimicking, but I could re replicate it in my mind. After hearing somebody speak once or twice, I would know what their rhythms would be. How did you start to speak again after you'd stopped? Well, Mrs. Flowers, a lady in my town, a black lady, had started me to reading when I was about eight. Really reading. I was already reading, but I mean, she started me to reading in the black school, and I read all the books in the black school library. And she had some contact with the white school and she would bring books to me, and I would just eat them up. And when I was about 11 and a half, she said to me one day, I used to carry a tablet around on which I wrote answers. And she asked me, do you love poetry? So I wrote, yes, it was a silly question for Mrs. Flowers, since she knew I just. She told me, you do not love poetry. You will never love it until you speak it, until it comes across your tongue, through your teeth, over your lips. You will never love poetry. And I ran out of her house. I thought, I'll never, I'll never go back there again. She was trying to take my friend. She came to the store, and she would <laughs> catch me and say, you do not love poetry. Not until you speak it. I'd run away. And every time she'd see me, she would just threaten to take my friend. And finally, I did take a book of poetry, and I went under the house and tried to speak. And could. Did you have to find your own voice after those? Oh, yes, I'm speaking? still, I mean, for years I did. I didn't even know where it was placed, for that matter. And then I didn't trust it. I was afraid of, not said this before, but I was afraid it might leave, you see. Since I had pushed it away so long, it might, on its own, just take off. And then muteness is much like any other addiction. It uh, stands just behind my eyesight, just behind my shoulder, in critical moments when a marriage ended, which I thought would never end. It stands there offering itself to me, saying, I've got something for you. Come to me. I'm really surprised to, to hear it's that. It's terrible. It's tempting to, to not speak? Delicious. <laughs> 
I guess hearing that from someone as eloquent as you makes it even harder to understand because you could use language to any effect. No. It's, so, <laughs> it's so tempting that when, when um, I'm really in bad shape, I sing, sing. And my mom and my son will find me wherever I am and stay with me and see me through that period because it's there, it's saying, come. Right. I can make life so simple for you. You'll never have to explain anything again. When you went to Ghana, you were searching for a home, but you left Ghana after about a year or so and went back to America. And you've lived where you're living now in North Carolina yes. for a few years, and you have a permanent position at a university there that you know you can keep as long as you want. It's a lifetime professorship. Um, do you feel like you have your home now? Does that really feel like, like home, or is part of you still searching for, for home? No, I believe North, North Carolina is my home. I really believe my home is in Winston-Salem. North Carolina. I know, however, life offers wonderful, and by that I mean full of wonder, uh, chances. I expect to be in Winston-Salem the rest of my life. My books are there, my paintings are there, my friends are there, and my work is there. I love the university, Wake Forest. However, I'm not to be, I will not pretend to myself or anyone else that I think I have any position forever. I know better. I know life. Now, it might turn out, but if something happened today, uh, well, I know how to call movers, and uh, I would just have to go. It would break my heart right now to even think about leaving. But I'm not, um, I will not fight the, I will not fight change when it is uh, relentless. If something comes up and I have to move on, then that's just one more move I will have to make. That was writer Maya Angelou. Her latest book in her series of autobiographies is titled All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes. It's published by Random House. Fresh Air is a production of WHYY Radio in Philadelphia. The engineer for this edition was Joyce Lieberman. Fresh Air is edited by Maeve McGoran. Amy Sallett is the associate producer. Danny Miller and I are the producers of the show. My name's Terry Gross, and I'd like to thank you for listening.